A warm welcome to all of you for this 15-minute uh, sessions on the humanistic approach to human security for all. This is the fourth and last the session of the Human Security for All conference organized by the Jena Declaration. The Jena Declaration is a project on the cultural approach to sustainability and human security for all and was, is together with the Club of Rome, the International Council for Philosophy and Human Sciences, several national commissions for UNESCO and others, one of the founding partners of it. This session will highlight liberal arts education as a powerful medium for promoting social awareness, understanding, values, and necessary changes in the content and pedagogy of that can make the full <laughs> spectrum of human education a more effective and conscious tool to promote human security. Before I leave the floor to the panelists, uh, please let me introduce myself very briefly. I'm the founder and holder of the UNESCO Chair on Global Understanding for Sustainability, sustainability at the Friedrich Schiller University of Jena here in Germany, initiator of the Jena Declaration, a WAS fellow and uh, the moderator of this session. We had to use much time uh, uh, of our session for discussion. First among the panelists, these are hopefully Raminder will join us, Raminder Kauner from, from the UK, Olympia Nidio from Italy, Daniel Lang from Germany, Pavlos Kouras from Greece, and Rana P.B. Singh from India. After this uh, first round of discussion, uh, the panel will answer the questions submitted by the viewers through the chat. So I'm encouraged uh, the viewers on the chat to prepare their question and to submit them to chat. All the panelists will, can read them and get prepared to, to answer them. But now, very first, a brief self-introduction by the speakers. Ladies first, uh, Olympia, please. Thank you, Ben, no, thank you very much. For me, it is a very interesting opportunity today to share with us our international program, Reconnecting with Your Culture, also in dialogue with the, the Jena Declaration, because uh, it is very important for us uh, to collaborate with the you and all your um, members um, in this international project. Um, uh, Reconnecting with Your Culture is an international pedagogical program, and uh, this uh, inter sorry, uh, this uh, international uh, this international um, pedagogical program today is active in uh, many countries around the world, and it is a, a very um, honor for us um, to promote this uh, program in collaboration with uh, the Jena Declaration and also with the ASEAN Culture Landscape Association uh, located in Seoul uh, in South Korea. Uh, Reconnecting with Your Culture also is a program in dialogue with Agenda 2030, and especially with the, the four-point um, uh, quality education. And uh, Reconnecting with Your Culture is, is organized in many um, international um, committees, Africa, America, Asia, and Europe, and also with specific national uh, committee in every um, continent. Um, this is uh, today our organization in America, in uh, Africa, about a whole in Occidental Africa, Europe, and Asia, with uh, the presence of India, Sri Lanka, in Indonesia, and Japan. Uh, Reconnecting with Your Culture is a pedagogical program born in 2020, uh, starting July 2020. And uh, after one year, we have realized many international events, seminars, and also three international congress um, um, or growing. <laughs> Um, very fast um, because uh, uh, during this uh, year um, also um, um, thanks uh, uh, the uh, pandemic uh, situation we have uh, a great opportunity uh, to share this program in many countries around the world. 
And after the first um, year uh, um, from the board of this program, uh, we have realized three international meetings, more uh, um, 1,000 seminars, and many, many specific lectures around the world in a specific school, uh, primary and above all in primary school. Uh, this program is also in a dialogue, in a partnership with the uh, Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs fair in Italy with ECOMOS and uh, above all uh, with many, many um, in, in international schools around the world. Um, Today, uh, we have realized also important uh, document uh, to share the contents of this pedagogical program. And uh, we have also received an important uh, award uh, next uh, September uh, during the uh, International um, Congress um, uh, will, uh, was take place in Mexico City uh, at the end of September uh, during the International Cultural uh, congresses in Mexico City last year. Uh, today, um, we have uh, many um, countries um, applied uh, this important pedagogical program, and uh, we have also realized an important document um, has the Tokyo Charter promoted in July 31, um, published in, in July 31 uh, during the Olympic Games, and also uh, a, a specific guide. Um, we, uh, uh, where uh, we um, describe exactly uh, the, the aims of this uh, pedagogical program. Now we have an important goal for 2024 because uh, for us it is very important to continue this uh, path around the world and above all to strong very well uh, the young generation to approach the significance of the uh, cultural local heritage. Um, the, this, this important program uh, have many, many um, aims, and I now I am very happy to share with you uh, this uh, um, finality of these uh, programs. Thanks, my colleagues. Uh, next one, maybe um, uh, Daniel. Can you just introduce yourself? Yes, I'm happy to introduce myself, and I also didn't prepare any slides because I, I don't manage to work with slides in 1.5 minutes. Um, so my name is Daniel Lang. Um, I'm a UNESCO chairholder at Leuphana University in Lüneburg. The UNESCO chair is labeled Higher Education for Sustainable Development. Besides that, I'm also a professor at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology for Real World Laboratory Design. And, um, you know, there is a multitude I, I could say, but I think particularly I want to briefly point you to something that this um, UNESCO chair, and this was mainly my predecessor Gerd Michelsen, and then um, also in collaboration with Matthias Barth, what they did at, at Leuphana, and which is a very nice example of a, of a humanistic approach to, um, to higher education or in higher education. That is that in at Leuphana University, all students entering um, the first semester do a cross um, topic Study. So they, they have different modules, and one of these modules, which is one third of the entire study time, is called um, Research Transforms, Responsible Action. And in this module, um, students really do a, a concrete project on sustainability accompanied by a lecture on sustainability. And the concrete example that also is mentioned in the in the abstract that, that we have submitted is that we did with half of the entire cohort, which is 750 students. We did already five years ago, we started a visioning process in our concrete community under the label Lüneburg 2030 plus, um, 25 visions for Lüneburg, which then as a project entered in the next phase where we developed concrete options. And now we are in a third phase where we work in real world laboratories. And just last week, we had a conference, and it's a conference week where all the students then present their work, their insights. And also in this last semester, we had, I think, 10 to 12 seminars working on the future of this concrete country, uh, of this concrete community, 
Lüneburg, and one example was, for instance, um, uh, a seminar working on the on the future of work. So I think that's a very nice example, and I'm happy to further explore during the discussion. Perfect. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, Pablos. Beno, thank you very much for inviting me to this wonderful panel. <laughs> um, I am Pablos Caburas from Greece, a professor of anthropology and ethnomusicology at the National and Capodistrian University of Athens. And I'm also um, UNESCO chairholder um, titled Anthropology of Traditional Music, Representing and Repositioning Intangible Cultural Heritage. So uh, my career has focused on uh, uh, three salient topics, humanistic approach, transdisciplinarity, human intelligence in various fields of uh, implementation and uh, I'm given the chance, I will elaborate later on. Thank you. Thank you. Rana, maybe just uh, your personal work and then we can, we can, you can we'll reconnect with your uh, culture later on again, okay? Okay. Can you introduce yourself, Rana? Yes. Myself, a cultural geographer and involved in the, so many rural activities, pilgrimages, and how the religious journey to be involved for the social awakening and cultural awakening, and what we call it deep education. So education, not with the books, but practically going to the schools, let them learn about the cultural heritage. And this way, we have started this uh, under the guidance of uh, Olympia, that is called reconnecting with the culture. So we have two basic things. The one thing is that theoretically, whatever we discuss, how practically to convert for the sustainable understanding through the religious perspective, but religious is a very wider term. We are not using in restriction. This is one. Second is that practically let the students at the primary school, they go to the heritage site, they learn from there, they co-share and then experience. And this way, in about 30 countries, such programs we have started in mostly below high school so that this new cadre may be developed for the social work and future sustainability model. And we are also using Jena, uh, that declaration model in that and then sustainable development goals altogether. Okay, thank you very much. And now Raminda who joined us a little bit late, but she's here now. Please go ahead, Raminda. Thank you. I'm, um, I'm very happy to be involved in this. Thank you for being um, here and also allowing me to participate. So myself, I'm trained in anthropology, art and archaeology. I'm now based in two departments, anthropology and international development. I'm a professor of anthropology and cultural studies. So you can see transdisciplinarity has been at the heart of my academic training from the outset. It's extended into the transsectoral public fora, as with the arts and heritage sectors where I worked as consultant, creative practitioner and as artistic director of the company Sahaya Visions, also a script writer, producer and creator. I engage diverse collaborative, especially in UK and India and now uh, just recently Pakistan. So it's inherently transnational and I believe in universities without walls, taking students out to be included in participatory projects with communities, as well as introducing <coughs> wider communities to how educational or academic work need not be a barrier, but a channel for multi-perspective multi-perspectival communication through not just words, but images, performances, film, and digital media. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. Um, yes, um, let's go into now uh, the, the, the main topic of, of the session. And my interest is in the next round, uh, just to that you can illustrate what your experiences are with uh, transdisciplinary research and cooperation mainly as a representative of the humanities in, in different projects you are engaged. 
and maybe just mentioning the fields you, you are making these experiences. What I would be interested is, what is the position normally of somebody who is coming into from the humanities into a transdisciplinary project? What hurdles and obstacles you can you probably uh, were confronted and how we could overcome them? So uh, who wants to take the word? Should I start? Yeah, go ahead, Pablos. Okay, um, first we need to, before we get into the point of transdisciplinarity in the humanities, we need to understand that uh, by transdisciplinarity, we mean a research effort conducted by investigators from different disciplines working jointly to create new conceptual, theoretical, methodological, and even translational from translation innovations. Uh, such activities aim at integrating and transcending discipline-specific approaches, addressing a common problem. Now, transdisciplinarity should be distinguished from interdisciplinarity. And I will not get into this, but... Uh, since we are asked to talk about our uh, the, uh, the way um, our experiences um, have uh, formed in using transdisciplinarity in um, uh, the human uh, sciences, I would say that I've always encountered a major problem uh, when I had to communicate with other disciplines, because it was always, uh, I, I realized that there was always a tendency on the part of the collaborators coming from other disciplines mm -hmm. to translate uh, what was the common uh, agenda or research problem in their methodologies. Without being able to reach uh, a compatible methodological framework. So it seems to me that um, one of the problems that transdisciplinarity um, can, um, can, uh, can cope with, can solve, is uh, by looking at and, and elaborating uh, on a new framework. This has been my contribution to the humanities. The new framework was um, an emphasis on human intelligence, but situated in the rather recent discovery made by physical anthropology, namely that we humans, modern humans, are the descendants of the subspecies of Homo sapiens sapiens. This is very important in my view, because it allows us to talk about choice. How? Because Homo sapiens sapiens has this capacity to think over thinking, to feel over feeling, to reflect over reflecting. Therefore, this whole issue of um, having the choice to decide whether to go one way or another, it's inherent in this species. Now, a side effect of this capacity is ego consciousness, because as we build on our urges towards survival, we end up capitalizing on a pseudo sense, an illusionary sense of being. This ego consciousness uh, saturates our activities when we are uh, when we are working in the area of humanities or when we um, uh, try to cooperate with other researchers. So to me, uh, the human intelligence project focuses on other levels of intelligence besides memory and reason. 
besides ego awareness, the very um, capacity of the being of the Homo sapiens sapiens to transcend his or her own egoity, egotism. This I find to be very important when we sit down to frame a um, frame a collaborative um, framework uh, model of how to cope with a common problem. The common problem could be fear, which is also in the essence, the essence of security, or um, a problem for um, 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 uh, for, for uh, from not being sure about uh, um, about the, the 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 needs, whether they will be satisfied or not, your everyday needs. So, in this sense, a meta consciousness level is required when we uh, when we um, go about to deal with awareness of different kinds economic awareness, uh, psychological awareness, <clears throat> awareness, educational awareness. There is another level that human intelligence can, can allow us to build on. And this is the awareness of awareness, the consciousness of consciousness. Okay. Thank you, Pablo. I think uh, this is very important to emphasize that in the humanities, we are dealing with uh, what is also called the double hermeneutics, that things that we are talking about have already a meaning and you have to always reflect that. Uh, I would like to ask Daniel, um, when he has a long experience in real laboratory uh, exercises, and you just uh, illustrated that, that every student is engaged in some project like that in uh, Leuphana University in Lüneburg. So what is, I mean, there you have a real transdisciplinary approach, including um, citizens, including local politicians and so on in, in all your project. What is your experience with this uh, in-depth transdisciplinary uh, work? Mm -hmm. um, I try to keep it short. So, so this is, you know, this could now be a, a, a very long- No, no, just the, the, the key, the key. Exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah. So, so I think that the first thing that is important for me that, um, you know, besides what, what Pavlos just mentioned, um, you know, there are these different notions of transdisciplinarity, but for me, a key component of transdisciplinarity is also that it not only goes beyond disciplines, but it also goes beyond academia. So it's really acknowledging that there are different different modes of knowing and knowledge um, in the world. Um, and that at the end of the day, it's it's only one mode of knowing if we come into the scientific realm. So that's that, that that's important. And this is how how I usually approach it. Um, so there are there are many challenges I could mention. So you know there are different epistemologies that we are facing if we go out out of out of the the, the ivory it's tower really already as, as as scientists, different scientific epistemologies. Um, and it's also you know it, um, there are there are different you know time frames, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's that's quite usual. But what I want to emphasize is rather the strength, particularly in a in an educational environment. So if we take um, a humanistic education seriously, which is focusing besides kind of the idea of a methodological training, uh, content related training for yeah. our student, and say, well, it's also about personal development really developing or coming closer to something like a, a practical wisdom. I think there is a lot of evidence and we have experienced this also in our projects that, you know, uh, a project and problem based ori orientation of your research is, is is key. And this is what we see in, in our in our in these settings I have just described so that our students learn many other things and and you know also develop as personalities in the settings and i think that is for me um one of the key aspects and the last aspect um i want to mention um is really that also the question who learns who is the educator and who is the learner fundamentally changes if we really take transdisciplinarity seriously because then you know also we as researchers are learners and often also the the students or the people the people from outside the academic world 
contribute to our learning experience. So I think if if we take this idea of transdisciplinarity seriously, it's you know the classical idea of learner and educator is also fundamentally changing. And how do you evaluate the, the students in that project? Do you evaluate the capacity to learn from one another, the capacity to learn from others, to, to the capacity to, to work with um, citizens, to, to work with certain stakeholders and so on? Or how do you evaluate uh, the students working in such projects? Well, I think the, the you know the evaluation is a is a is a is a is a major challenge in these in this project. We have different approaches. So in the in the first semester, we really um, evaluate the the reports the students are writing and the reflections okay. on the reports. We have also another transdisciplinary project where we deliberately separate kind of the project work from the the learning evaluation, where we really then have a, a oral exam, which is only focusing on the on the learning progress and the self-reflection of the students and not on the project success. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Uh, Raminder is working uh, in a transdisciplinary field, especially by integrating local artists, as far as I know, and, uh, and, and, and so on. What is your experience as to working in arts, with artists, uh, local, uh, local artists, uh, and so on, uh, as a cultural anthropologist? Well, that's a very interesting question, and I think if we could talk about transdisciplinarity by first unpacking disciplinarity, what is that about? It's about in, um, enforcing some kind of discipline on knowledge worlds with boundaries, with gatekeepers, with all kinds of um, markers of achievement, etc. And that in itself, those disciplines or the disciplinarity of those disciplines tries to compartmentalize life and its studies when we all know that life is very messy. And this is what artists really revel in. Uh, they're not interested in compartmentalizing, but actually reveling in that mess. And from that messiness, which is something not, that we shouldn't fear, because it's really about a dissolution of boundaries, which are, much of which are artists artificial um, and even with anthropologists there's a, a sense that you can't be an anthropologist without getting messy i.e doing field work in order to gather insights and deconstruct your own preconceptions and prejudices and work with them in order to you know um, uh, uh, communicate across cultural um, boundaries cultural context so in a similar way an anthropologist who is based in ac an academia has an artistic approach but when it comes to returning to the academic field when it comes to returning to the university then those boundaries those disciplinarities and and, and all those other benchmarks come into place and I think artists teach us that for, you know we can get messy and not lose our our bearings and and not fear it and and also develop some interesting ways to connect with communities where we can go beyond words words can you know are beautiful they can be poetic, they can be evocative, but they also can challenge people, especially if they are literacy challenged. And I think um, th this is where the arts play a really important part. Yeah, okay, wonderful. Um, um, Olympia and Rana, they are working in this Reconnect with Your Culture project. Uh, that's what I know best from them. It's not the only thing I know from them, but that's what I know best. And the idea is to, to bring into education, as far as I understood it, the, the local tradition, local cultures. And mm -hmm. there, of course, you are confronted or working with all types of people from regional settings, communities, cities, and so on. What is your experience in across the world? I mean, you have... Uh, I, Reconnect with your culture international, and then you have all these local organizations or regional and national organizations. So maybe uh, Olympia under your international overview, and then maybe Rana your experience in the in the Asian uh, part of the world. Olympia, please. Okay, thank you, thank you. No, this is interesting uh, questions, and um, reconnecting with your culture um, allows us to understand the value 
of the dialogue among culture and also last experience in Japan with an international exposition allows us to um, connect different children um, around the world and also to uh, also understand the value of this important dialogue for peace yes. in the world because we need peace and we need more contact among us and the culture is a very important basis um, to uh, build this, um, this um, important situation uh, in our common house. And I now I invite Professor Rana because Professor Rana is the president of Reconnecting with Your Culture Asia uh, to share with us uh, um, the, the, this specific experience in Asia of this program please rana okay, okay thank you <coughs> just to let me read a few lines that give you give you the concluding our whatever experience we have one should realize that all the problems of understanding and communication generate from the mind then solution will also come from the mind the boundary and binary of subject should be close to enable human Services. Let us think of the world as a cultural whole through RWIC, Science for Society and Culture, and reciprocally, the cycle is going like, like a spiral, not circle, but it's spiral. It is going into infinity. And what we find that if you have to say in a more philosophic way, what to be done, we come to this conclusion, what Mahatma Gandhi once said, and we have referred in our writings, we need to promote education for life, education through life and education throughout life, through the cultural understanding, deeply rooted interconnection with the local heritage, and then co-shared that knowledge for making better children, better education, better society, and this way that will be a model. So we are working that way. So this is the general summary, what we got from two, three countries we have worked together. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Very important. Um, I mean, if you have now this overview or, or this vision of all the participants, what they, where they are engaged in and, and what their experiences are in very short uh, form, uh, if you had the chance to restructure the schooling system on whatever level, to, to prepare young people in a better way for what you are interested to do, what would you what would be your recommendation for the restructuring of schooling, primary schooling, and all types of schooling before the university level? This is a question to all of you. <laughs> I, I I can um, I just say okay, something very practical. Okay practical, which is in, in based in UK. Um, if in the past in, we could, um, as artists or academics, immediately contact teachers and uh, with their help, we could uh, engage students in primary and secondary schools in a variety of projects. Nowadays, they are being turned into academies uh, with executives and they, 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 you know, they can be quite pan local regional even national and you have to go to the top in order to get to the bottom i.e not the bottom in a kind of hierarchical way but to the grassroots so there are there, it's it's a mountainous climb and so these uh, these impositions from above actually get in the way of us trying to connect on the grassroots level i wonder if that's the case in other places around the world Pablos, about Greece, yes, no, no. Um, <laughs> your experience and um, um, your vision. Yeah, it's a, a, a it's a very uh, it's a difficult, straightforward but difficult question. But anyway, I would go with um, uh, I would go uh, introducing by introducing this approach to human intelligence right from the first stages of education. Teach uh, <clears throat> show the way to people how to understand that everything is mind 
as Professor Rana said, but uh, show them that they have the ability to transcend mind. Mind can transcend mind. This they can learn. And they can learn also that uh, <clears throat> what we see as reality is a play between opposites because our mind, our habitual mind makes us see the world this way. So having first this philosophical inner, actually lived, actually experienced philosophical background, I would, you know, formulate a framework for introducing the youths to this reality. Number two, I would use the arts, especially the performing arts, which I'm more familiar with. You know, the fundamental concept in the arts is performance. Performance means realizing something while being assessed for the realization of this something. There's an audience assessing you. So performance, like consciousness, is always about other, another, is about otherness. And we artists, uh, instructors, researchers tend to hide our I-ness, our ego, behind the discussion on the level of the other. So our performances focus on otherness, hiding the awareness of I-ness. So I would try to teach how to move from a performance of otherness to othering performance, completely changing, reversing the process. Why do, why do this? Because, you know, reality is not only the play of opposites, but if we reverse the flow of the opposites, then we can come closer to a deeper realization, an illumination that is akin to a higher level of intelligence. Mm. And Daniel, I would like to ask you, I mean, with your real laboratory um, experiences, you, you certainly can uh, see what are the competences and the lacking competences of people coming out of a traditional schooling system. Uh, what you see as the, I mean, what you, your real life experiences, it goes in the direction of what um, pa uh, Pablo just uh, 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 described. So what kind of competences you, are you missing? In, in, in your uh, projects um, in the, are the participants of in your projects well I, I think um, you know I want to move away from a deficit logic because I think the competencies are all there we just need to okay. enable people to let them unfold um, and and give them the the opportunity that they can really further develop their their competencies and you know i think it's it's difficult to 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 translate to english but in german we have this um this notion of gestaltungskompetenz which is not really if a design competence does not really um match the the, the gestaltungskompetenz but it's really you know a competent a competency to um to think in systems, to include normative notions into into your thinking, but also having a, a foundation in a in a good basic <coughs> in, a, in a good in a good in a good basic knowledge. But I think it's really this competence to engage with the world. And I think we, you know, in the the long term discussions, and Ben, you have been involved this far longer than I have. You know, the, all the discussion about education for sustainable development. I think if we would take this seriously. There would be so much there and we still have not changed our educational system in a way as we already trying to you know based on on the things that we that we already know and that is also on the highest level of uh of of unesco discussions of un discussions i think it's it, it's all there we just need to need to take it seriously and change the the system that we can really live walk the talk yeah I mean, my, my view about changing the education system is that it's only possible in the bottom-up uh, process that, that parents 
are calling for other competence for, for their children. If you, if you go the traditional way from the top down, even to produce a manual, <laughs> a schooling manual takes three to five decades. I mean, what the hell? How long takes it to have other changes? So, uh, and I think the Reconnect uh, project is, is some kind of a bottom-up project to, to have at least an influence in the, in the schooling topics and the schooling mm. system. Uh, how do you see the, the potential of the parents or engaged citizen to mm. change the schooling system? Or student content? Uh, yes. Exactly. Yes, Ben. Uh, um, the program Reconnecting with Your Culture um, allows us to understand the importance of the dialogue among different um, uh, generations. No? Um, this is very important to reinforce this dialogue and we have to invest in the young generation by helping to recover above all the heredity roots. We have to introduce the thinking of a local cultural heritage from kindergarten and help build the future thanks to uh, the knowledge of our cultural heritage and this is is possible thanks to the dialogue among different generations mm. Rana? The, also Ms. Rana only please the two lines i have to add taking the paulos daniel and beno what we call in our culture like uh, paulo says added this realization we call in philosophic term and what we are using in our school from realization to revelation. Realize something awakened. So that should be like this. And second most important thing is that it should come from the bottom, what we call locality to universality. It is nothing like a positive way, what Bernard has added. And this in some of the schools, like one case in Varanasi, using our this RWYC program, we have started last year, and these are complete change. Their behavior change. We go and their children are so much insightful about art, writing about the culture, thinking about the future. This we want to generate. Our life is just close by. We want to create that generation. So this way, that thing to be linked, these three philosophic ideas. And practically, we have to do from the grassroots level. In Indian term, we call it sansakar. It is start from very childhood by mother. So that training should start in the family itself. If they are not respecting their parents, how they can respect the teachers? So that thing also to be started in school. And thanks to Smith School in Banaras, they are doing this and they have proved this. They said, look, no program. Suddenly they have called me. Come on, Ranaji. Go to that, check that. I have gone in the field, my goodness, within one year, wonderful program, and that has been appreciated by RWYC meetings. So this is the way, practically, the three ideas I try to link. Thank you very much for giving the opportunity. Raminder, I see you, Raminder. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I think these are really great ideas, and I wish I could live on a planet where we could implement them. But I don't think we can. And the reason is, one of the main reasons is that um, we are um, working in systems with, with national curricula across the board. So the nation state, which is, uh, as your paper pointed out, Benno, is a top-down mechanism, which is trying to reproduce compliant and obedient citizens as the next generation. Whilst those curriculum or curricula are in place, and this is repeated across the world, we cannot enter and bring in these beautiful visionary universalizing ideas. One way forward is to actually um, uh, persuade these people at the top or in the middle uh, to uh, about the benefits of transnational curricula. The benefits of transnational curricula buying into their logic would be that, for instance, you, you know, it's about communication. It's about linking migrants with other parts of the world and mainstreams. It's also about trade. If you want to use that kind of language, it's about openness. It's about business. So I think we need to develop a language which, which also in some senses challenges those, the language of those people at the top, especially when they have the power to, to enforce national curricula. In these final six minutes, you know, the, the conference also to get ideas how to have an impact on 
on uh, schooling curricula and especially in respect of human security of all. So I'm asking you all, um, what role can the humanistic approach or the humanities have uh, play uh, to improve human security at all, uh, for all? Where do you see uh, the biggest potential? In a few sentences, not too much uh, sophisticated, very simple <laughs> recommendation. What would you say? What is, are the strengths of the humanities to improve human security of all, for all? Can I say something? Okay. Uh, we all know that life depends on hermeneutics. <laughs> we interpret the world and then we stick to interpretations. So what would the humanistic approach contribute? Could a humanistic approach contribute to education? To teach everybody, not only students, parents, everyone, that interpretations is a kind of free will result, but free will that does not move from the level of um, uh, realization to revelation, as Rana said, <laughs> then it becomes dangerous. Interpretations that cannot transcend themselves within the system, they are dangerous ideas conducive to ideologies and problematic sources for conflict, war, uncertainty, and everything that insecurity accounts for. The big part of the current curriculum are nationalistic curricula, and they are producing a lot of uh, potential for conflicts. <laughs> Who else? Daniel, do you have any, any, any suggestion? <laughs> you know, it's, it's always difficult for me because I'm not coming from the humanities. But maybe I can con contribute from a from yeah, a friend. Yeah, I mean, humanities in the extent... <laughs> Also, qualitative social sciences that are part yeah, of humanities, in my sense. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, and and I think um, Raminda men, mentioned this. You know, it's I, I think it's it's uh, starting from this idea that we live in a messy world, and that you know that it's not uh, and trying to to take this seriously also in our educational approaches and not always try to to say well we integrate everything or this is the right perspective but really acknowledging diversity and then in the next step trying to see how to deal with where it. are the where are the connections between the different between between the different approaches mm -hmm. and i think that that could be a that could be a way forward to really you know appreciate and acknowledge diversity and not try to make everything into right. one box Great, great. I'm giving the word also to Olympia and to Rana for a short uh, final final statement in that respect. Okay. But where for, do you see the strengths uh, of, of your approach? I, I think for all uh, is uh, for me and we, need, we have to put on the center the culture because only thanks to the culture together we can build a good world. Yes, yeah. this is my thinking for all. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we appreciate Messi, but we have also to know mosaicness. Like when you are talking about national frame in India, impossible. There are 20 official languages. There are different culture. And that's why we started from the grassroots, bottom up, regional based culture, and then to project that will work for ancient culture like China, Korea, Japan, and India. The four countries I have studied. So that is my perspective to just humbly inform you. Raminder, you have the last, very last word. Uh, well, I, I think if we were to re-envisage human security in terms of life enhancing and creative communication, uh, where here we could connect people or begin to think of connecting people in an increasingly divided world through um, themes that we all, you know, uh, need to live with, such as food, relationships, care, caring, dealing with economic insecurities and environmental challenges. I think um, this communication 
which is also part of co-creative methods, which plays a part in artistic and anthropological work, will lead to lasting relationships and networks. And uh, yeah, I think um, human security in itself could be a, a term that could be unpacked and, and, and made into an enriching and enhancing um, sort of prospect. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. I think we were uh, uh, approaching a lot, uh, a lot of points or, or uh, mobilizing a lot of points and ideas. Um,